Hello, Harry Cliff here. A couple of weeks ago, a result came out from an antimatter experiment that caused a fierce debate on physics social media. Now, depending on who you follow, this is either an incredibly cool and exciting result or the most pointless experiment in the history of the known universe. So what's all the fuss about? Well, the experiment in question is called Alpha G. It's based at CERN, the European Particle Physics Laboratory. And what the team there had done was to trap antimatter atoms, atoms of anti-hydrogen in a magnetic bottle, which is no mean feat, and we'll get onto that in a second, and then let them go to see whether they fall under gravity like ordinary atoms do, or whether maybe, just maybe, they might fall upwards. Now that might sound bonkers, but if antimatter did fall up under the Earth's gravity, that could solve one of the biggest mysteries in physics, namely why the observable universe appears to be made only of matter and not antimatter. So what did the Alpha G team find? Well, they trapped their antiatoms, they released them, and drum roll, they fell downwards, just as everyone had predicted. Or, to put it another way, if back in 1666 Isaac Newton had been sitting under an anti-apple tree, then an anti-apple would have fallen on his head in exactly the same way as an ordinary apple. Uh, except, being an anti-apple, it would have annihilated his head and also blown a big hole in the east of England. And yes, I know the story about the apple landing on Newton's head is a myth, but it's, it is a fun image. Anyway, when Alpha G announced their result, a load of physicists on the platform formerly known as Twitter fired off various former tweets, which can basically be summarised as Antimatter falls down, duh. Meanwhile, another group of physicists got terribly excited and celebrated the incredible technical achievement of Alpha G in making antiatoms, trapping them so they don't annihilate with the walls of their container, and then being able to measure the effect of gravity on antimatter. So why these two radically different reactions to this experimental result? Let's dig into the science behind Alpha G. Technically, what Alpha G claims to be testing is something called the weak equivalence principle, which simply states that the gravitational force on a body depends only on its mass and not what it's made from. That means that from gravity's point of view, an apple and an anti-apple are exactly the same. The weak equivalence principle is central to Einstein's theory of general relativity, our current best theory of gravity. Now, general relativity has passed every experimental test thrown at it with flying colours and is regarded as one of the two pillars of modern fundamental physics alongside quantum field theory. So it would have been a huge shock if antimatter had indeed fallen up, because not only would it have broken general relativity, it would have proven Einstein wrong. However, there are some very fringe theories out there in the deepest, darkest corners of the archive that claim if antimatter was repulsed by the gravity of ordinary matter, it could solve all kinds of problems, including explaining why there's no antimatter in the observable universe. It would all have got pushed out of sight by the repulsion of gravity from ordinary matter, and perhaps even allow cosmologists to do away with inflation, an incredibly rapid period of expansion that's supposed to have taken place in the very first moments of the Big Bang. So even if it seemed really, 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 really unlikely that antimatter fell up, the argument goes it was still worth doing the experiment because the impact would be so revolutionary. This potentially huge reward made it worthwhile, despite the tiny odds, a bit like buying a lottery ticket. And perhaps more importantly, Alpha G wasn't developed from scratch. The key technology behind it was actually adapted from another experiment called Alpha 2, which measures the spectrum of anti-hydrogen atoms, the, the simplest atoms of antimatter made of a single antiproton orbited by a single positron or anti-electron. The big challenge of working with antiatoms is that they annihilate on contact with ordinary matter, meaning that they have to be kept away from the walls of any vessel you put them in. This makes working with antiatoms extremely tricky. I was lucky enough to get to visit the Alpha experiment back in 2019 when I was working on my book How to Make an Apple Pie from Scratch, buy it now please, link in the description. 
The experiment is housed in a warehouse at CERN with the extremely cool title, the Antimatter Factory, where physicists manufacture antiatoms by combining antiprotons with positrons. The positrons are produced by a radioactive source and then funneled up into the Alpha G device where they're trapped in something called a penning trap, essentially a special container that uses electric and magnetic fields to keep the positrons away from the walls of the vessel. Meanwhile, the antiprotons are created by slamming protons into a target using one of CERN's particle accelerators. The antiprotons are then slowed down using the antiproton decelerator and Elena rings before finally being funneled up into the Alpha-G experiment and stored in a penning trap. Next comes the really tricky part. The antiprotons and positrons are allowed to mix together to form electrically neutral atoms of antihydrogen. Now, because they're electrically neutral, they can't easily be manipulated by electric and magnetic fields. So Alpha-G uses an incredibly powerful magnetic bottle, effectively, to trap the antiatoms as they are created. However, when they're created, most of the antiatoms are moving too fast to be trapped by Alpha-G's magnetic bottle and smack into the walls of the vessel and annihilate. Only a small fraction are moving slowly enough to hold on to, allowing Alpha-G to trap just a few anti-atoms at a time. This cycle is then repeated around 50 times over the space of about 4 hours, allowing Alpha-G to trap around 100 anti-atoms in one go. Then, finally, the anti-atoms are released by switching off two so-called mirror coils, effectively stoppers at the end of the magnetic bottle, and then the physicists at Alpha-G watch to see which way the anti-atoms go. If you see more anti-atoms annihilating at the bottom of the vessel than at the top, that tells you that antimatter falls under gravity. So, what did Alpha-G find? Well, after numerous repeats of the experiment with different magnetic fields, they showed conclusively that antimatter falls down. They also were able to measure the acceleration of antimatter under gravity, getting a result of around 75% of g, the standard acceleration of ordinary matter under gravity, with an error of about 15%. In other words, at the current level of precision, it looks like antiatoms are accelerated towards the Earth at roughly the same rate as ordinary atoms. Future experiments will aim to improve the precision of this measurement, with the ultimate goal of measuring the acceleration of antimatter under gravity down to one part in a million. So that is one incredibly impressive experiment. But as I said earlier, a lot of my colleagues were really pretty nonplussed by Alpha-G's result. Why? Well, let's dig a little deeper. Now, as we saw earlier, if antiatoms had indeed fallen up, that would have broken the rules of general relativity, proven Einstein wrong, and shaken fundamental physics to its foundations. But there were other reasons besides the success of general relativity why many physicists were totally unsurprised by Alpha-G's result. The first relates to where the mass of an atom or anti-atom actually comes from. A hydrogen atom is made of one electron in orbit around one proton, and a proton is made up of two up quarks and a down quark. But if you add up the masses of the electron, the two up quarks and the down quark, you find that together they only account for a piffling 1% of the mass of the atom. The other 99% comes from the energy stored in the mighty bonds of the strong force that hold the quarks together inside the proton. So even if antiparticles were repelled by the gravity of ordinary matter, that would only affect 1% of the mass of the antiatom, meaning that it would still fall downwards just ever so slightly slower. And there's another reason why we arguably already know that antimatter falls down. As the Alpha-G team acknowledged in their paper, measurements of how antiparticles spiral around magnetic fields have already shown they must feel almost exactly the same gravitational acceleration as ordinary particles. These experiments measure something called the cyclotron frequency, essentially the rate at which a charged particle orbits in a magnetic field. This regular spiraling can be thought of as a kind of clock, with each orbit of the particle or antiparticle acting like a tick of the clock. What's this got to do with gravity? Well, one of the predictions of general relativity is that time flows at different rates depending on the strength of gravity. 
So this means that a clock on top of Mount Everest, where gravity is weaker, runs slightly faster than a clock at sea level, where gravity is stronger. So, if particles and antiparticles felt different gravitational accelerations, they would experience time at a different rate as well, meaning that their cyclotron frequencies would be measured to be different. The fact they come out the same has shown that they must feel the same gravitational acceleration to around one part in a thousand. So what should we make of Alpha G's result? Well, on balance, I think it's probably fair to say that it has a rather limited impact on our fundamental understanding of antimatter, gravity, or the universe as a whole. But one rather fun consequence of Alpha G's result that American astrophysicist and science writer Ethan Siegel recently pointed out is that it strikes a serious blow against the prospects for ever being able to develop warp drive. Warp drive is a technology that often features in science fiction shows like Star Trek that in principle could allow spacecraft to travel across vast distances through the universe, essentially by compressing space-time in front of the craft and expanding it behind it. Now to achieve this you need a kind of negative gravitational mass, so if antimatter had been repelled by gravity that might have been one of the best ways of actually making this technology a reality. But putting science fiction to one side, there is something seriously impressive about creating anti-atoms, trapping them, and then measuring the effect of gravity on them. Alpha G is undeniably a seriously cool experiment, regardless of whether its results are surprising or not. And as an experimentalist myself, I have a lot of sympathy for spokesperson of Alpha G, Jeffrey Hank's point of view, which is that no matter how well you think you understand your theory, until you test something, you don't really know whether it's true or not. So hats off to Alpha G. If you've enjoyed this video, please do like and subscribe. And if you'd like to know more about the quest to understand the fundamental building blocks of our universe, you can read about it in my book, How to Make an Apple Pie from Scratch. I'll pop a link in the description and also a link to Ethan's article. See you next time.